Many people are concerned about Alzheimer's disease, but new research shows that there is a lot that we can do to prevent it, and the key is food. When people consume foods that are high in what is called saturated fat, their risk is higher. Uh, their risk of Alzheimer's can be as much as tripled. And the foods that contain this bad fat are dairy products, especially cheese, but really all dairy products, also meats, including chicken, which so many people are eating. These foods, we believe, increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's. Now, it's also important to avoid what are called trans fats. Those are the fats that are in many baked goods and some snack foods. They also increase the risk of Alzheimer's. And to the extent that the diet is plant-based, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, that's the healthiest diet because it, it has almost none of these bad fats at all and is very, very healthful. Now, there's more to it. It's good to exercise regularly. It's good to use the mind by studying um, you know, documentaries, reading books, and making sure that we're not just simply watching television or things like that. If we put these things together, we believe that we can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's quite substantially. Many people imagine that if you have Alzheimer's disease, it's simply because it's in your genetics. You inherited it from your parents. But genes are not destiny. In other words, there are some genes. For example, the genes for the color of your eyes. Those are dictators. The genes say you're going to have blue eyes and that's it. You can't argue. But the genes for Alzheimer's disease are more like committees. They make suggestions. They say you could get Alzheimer's disease depending on what you eat. And many disease genes are in the same category. There are genes for diabetes. There are genes for cancer. There are genes that affect our weight, but they're not dictators. So we can argue with them and say, I don't think I want to get any of these diseases. It's very important to remember. We have more control than you might have imagined. Your body needs tiny amounts of iron and copper for certain functions. But the problem is, if you get too much of either one of those, too much iron or too much copper, that can increase the risk of brain problems according to the best evidence that we have. These metals, iron and copper, in the body, they oxidize in the same way as an iron pan can rust or a copper coin can oxidize over time and turn brown or black. In your body, this oxidation happens too. And so iron and copper produce free radicals as they oxidize, the free radicals damage the brain. So what does that mean? That means, number one, avoiding meat. You wanted to avoid it anyway because of the bad fat, but it also has iron and copper. But it also means being careful about the cookware that you're using, the pots and pans that you're using, and be careful about um, other sources of iron and copper if it's added to vitamins or other sources. Everyone should take vitamin B12, and the amount is 2.4 micrograms per day for an adult. A little bit different numbers for children or for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, but not, not very different. And so the number to remember is 2.4 micrograms. However, when you buy a supplement, you very soon discover that they all have somewhat more than that. And it's quite safe. It will not hurt you, even if you take more. But you need vitamin B12 for healthy nerves and he healthy blood. And everyone should be taking vitamin B12. Food is not everything. It's also important to exercise. You have to lace up your athletic shoes and get out of the house and go running down the road a little bit so that your heart beats and it brings blood and oxygen to your brain. Uh, researchers at the University of Illinois showed that when people take a good, fast walk, three times a week for 40 minutes, that it actually reverses brain shrinkage. It's also important to get exercise for the brain. Reading books, watching documentaries, really staying well informed, or even doing things like word games. 
These are things that keep your brain active, and it's important to participate in them too. And finally, it's important to get some sleep. So many people these days are working, 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 and they're never stopping. It's important to stop, let the brain rest and recover, and between physical activity, intellectual activity, and good sleep, those complement the healthy diet in protecting the brain. Many people are unsure how to start with a new diet. So we break it into two steps. And I've never seen anyone unable to do this. Step one, don't change your diet for the first week. During that time, just check out the possibilities. What I mean is, think about the foods that you could have on a healthy diet. Which foods have no animal products at all? So, okay, for breakfast, maybe I would have some porridge oats, or uh, maybe I would have pancakes, but without the butter all over the top. Um, if I've never tasted soya milk or almond milk, now's the time to try it. So I take a week and I explore foods for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and also snacks, and also restaurant meals. And once I've found out what they are, all vegan, all, no animal products at all, then I go to step two, which is for 21 days, for, th for three weeks, I have only the foods that I know I like, but that are free of animal products, and at the end of 21 days, your tastes change, you're starting to feel better, if you wanted to lose weight, you're losing weight, and then it becomes very, very easy. So break it into two steps. Number one, check out the possibilities. Number two, give yourself three weeks, it'll change your life. To help people to change their diets, at the Physicians Committee, we've started a program called the Kickstart, or its real name is the 21 day vegan kickstart. The idea is we're going to take 21 days and during that period of time I will send you every day a package by email with menus, recipes, cooking videos and a chance to ask questions in a message board. And we have it in English, we have it in Spanish, we have it in Mandarin, we have one for people from India and one for people from Japan and we've had almost 500,000 people go through this program. So I encourage you to try it. It's at www.pcrm.org. It's the Kickstart program and it's lots of fun. We also have a program called the Food for Life program. Food for Life instructors are people who come to Washington, D.C. and we spend three days of intensive training and we show you how to teach classes in your own community. So wherever you live, you can teach people about how food works, how about how food affects the health, and also how to make these healthy foods. So it's a mixture of nutrition and also cooking instruction. It's called Food for Life. It's lots of fun. The Food for Life uh, class is offered to anyone who has an interest in nutrition. Some people are physicians, some are dietitians, some are nurses, but some are simply people who are not scientists or doctors, but are interested in learning these skills. And in turn, they can go and teach in their communities. So to find more information, you'll see it at our website, pcrm.org.